Okay, well, my clock officially says two o'clock, everyone. So we will go ahead and begin our weekly webinar. I'm Kelly G. Loeb, your host, and happy to have you all with us today. A few housekeeping notes, as always. Um, please make sure to mute yourselves unless you have a question or comment. You are encouraged to use the chat feature while we are meeting today if you have something you'd like to ask our presenter. Uh, and then um, we will allow some time after she's given her slides to open up the conversation beyond the chat as we need to. Um, you can enable the closed captioning by clicking on the CC button at the bottom of your screen. So feel free to do that if you would like to. Uh, we are recording. So if you know someone that could be here today, feel free to let them know that it will be available on YouTube within 24 hours. Or if you want to go back and watch it again, I know we're going to get some really great information from Dr. Morris. So that's another reason, another reason we like to record. Um, and I think that's all the housekeeping notes I have for now. I do want to remind all of you that a week from today, um, we will have our next webinar. And I'll tell you the topic about uh, for that before we're finished. Uh, but we also have what I think is fair to call the world premiere of a documentary that the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center put together uh, called Why. And it's a look at um, early stage dementia, which I think a lot of you have uh, some vested interest in. We are having a free screening at the Glenwood Arts Theater on 95th Street near Mission Road. It begins at 6.30. Uh, it is entirely free. And when I talked to the movie theater people today, they told us that the screening will be in their biggest, best, most wonderfully lit theater. So they're rolling out a red carpet for us. I'm not sure there will be a literal red carpet, but they're treating us all very well. They're excited to have us come out. It's a beautiful movie. I've already seen it. Um, and I think that you will find it quite moving and educational. Um, so next Thursday night at 6.30, when you get your next My Alliance newsletter, you'll see information about it in there. And we encourage you to come out. That's the world premiere. It's only showing at the Glenwood one night, but we are also working on other showings all around the city and all around the state of Kansas and wherever we can get it in. So if you can't make it Thursday, don't despair, you will have another opportunity. So with that, let's turn our focus to the speaker of the day. And this is Dr. Jill K. Morris. And Dr. Morris is a neuroscientist and assistant professor in the Department of Neurology at the University of Kansas Medical Center. She is researching the differences in each person's response to exercise and the implications for overall brain health. Dr. Morris's primary research focus is investigating the genetic and metabolic contributions to Alzheimer's disease, focusing on cellular energy metabolism. And she will say more about that as she gets started. But I just saw a question in the chat about uh, how long the Y movie is. I think that's an important question. It's about 30, 38 minutes, so it's not an hour. Um, and we will have time after the movie for questions and comments. Um, but yeah, we're not asking you to attend a marathon or anything. It's uh, the whole event would be maybe an hour, maybe a little more, depending on how enthusiastic the audience is about asking questions. Um, if you have more questions, feel free to use the chat. I'll watch that, Dr. Morris, while you're presenting. Um, so you can focus on telling us the, the good fuel for thought. So with that being said, I'm going to mute myself. And Dr. Morris, you have the mic. All right. Thank you, Kelly. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, awesome. And I just wanted to also second her thoughts about the Y movie. It's just phenomenal. They did a really great job with it. So if you're able to attend, you won't regret it. Um, okay, so I'm just going to jump in. I'm Jill Morris. And yes, I'm going to talk to you about Fuel for Thought and our work on the importance of energy metabolism for brain health. So let's see if I can get going here. My slides are not advancing. There we go. Okay. So I just wanted to start with this overview slide. And these first couple of slides, I actually show in a brain metabolism class that I teach. I just wanted to give a little bit of rationale for why we're so interested in brain metabolism. So your brain has just this voracious appetite for energy. It actually consumes as much uh, a much higher proportion of fuel by weight than most of your or other organs. It only accounts for about 2% of your body weight, about 1 50th of your body weight. 
but at rest, it actually accounts for nearly 20% or one fifth of your whole body energy use. So energy metabolism is just it's extremely important in your brain. So what is that energy used for in your brain? Well, the majority of energy in your brain goes towards actual firing of your neurons, and that's needed to transmit signals between your brain cells. But the last third of your energy in your brain goes towards other processes called housekeeping processes that are needed to just maintain the integrity of your system. So this also includes processes such as responding to stress, repairing damage, and just keeping your systems running smoothly, much like a housekeeper in your hotel. So there's every time, every single time a neuron fires, every single time you need to build a protein, all of these things require energy. Okay. Sorry, there we go. Okay, so part of our hypothesis is that as you age, your cells are exposed to more stress and more repair is needed. So living in the Midwest, we are accustomed to storms and occasionally um, we have to deal with storm damage. So I'm sure many of you have dealt with shingles missing on your roof when you have a really strong wind. Um, if you don't repair that damage from a storm, then it can cause bigger issues. So you can have issues actually inside of your house as well as outside. Um, and if you don't, and this is demonstrated here, if you don't have money to fix the damage, it can obviously lead to these bigger problems. So in a similar manner, you can envision that energy in your cells can be used like molecular money. You need it to fix issues that are cropping up in your cells due to storms that you encounter in your own health. So just like if you don't have money to fix your roof, if you don't have energy to fix and repair um, things that are happening in your brain cells or to contribute to proper housekeeping, we hypothesize that this contributes to impaired proteostasis or protein folding and accumulation of these plaques and tangles that we know are the neuropathological hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. Now, it's still not understood if energy metabolism is upstream or downstream of these protein folding issues, but nonetheless, it is a clear contributor to brain health, and we tend to think of it as more upstream. So the study of energy metabolism is really at the very root of my research program and that of many of my colleagues at the KU Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Um, you can kind of think of, of your brain as a car, just like a car has multiple parts that all play a key role in its function. Um, your body also has key parts that play a role in the generation of energy and its use. So in your car, you need fuel, you need intact fuel lines, and you need a, an engine that works in order for your car to drive. Any of these um, issues with any of those particular components can cause you to not be able to drive your car. Well, the same thing is true with your brain. Um, you need fuel, and I'll talk about fuel in a minute for your brain, but you also need a good vascular system, um, and you also need an intact engine. And mitochondria are organelles in the body that are sort of the engines of cells that you can actually use. That's where um, ATP is actually generated in the body. But you have to have fuel, you have to be able to get it there, and then you have to be able to generate the energy. So this is why cardiovascular disease and diabetes are risk factor for Alzheimer's disease and why we're so interested in sort of understanding this. Um, so yeah, our work really just focuses on targeting these particular systems to improve brain health. So I put this slide on here because um, <laughs> it's not always clear when I talk about brain fuel, what exactly that, that means. Um, and despite a great need for energy, your brain really doesn't have that much of an energy reserve stored away for when it needs it. So unlike your muscles and other organs, which can store excess carbohydrates, your brain brain needs to be constantly supplied with energy and oxygen in order to run properly. So if your blood supply to the brain is cut off or disrupted, like during a stroke or a head injury, neurons can start shutting down pretty quickly. Um, this may seem like a flaw, but it's actually really critical to brain function um, because if our cells contain, if our brains contain cells that stored back backup power. This would actually take up more space between neurons and increase the length that, that your electrical signals would have to travel that would require even more energy. So our brains are really designed to be very efficient, although this comes at a cost, especially in times of emergencies or accidents. But the brain, the main fuel of the brain is glucose or blood sugar, and it can go into the brain um, quite readily, but lactate and ketones can also readily be used by the brain. And I'm gonna be focusing primarily on glucose and lactate during this presentation. So glucose is blood sugar. 
um, and it's the primary fuel for the brain. So it's actually taken up primarily into sort of helper cells or glial cells rather than neurons themselves. So I drew this little drawing here. You can see the glial cells and your neurons that you typically think of as brain cells. We actually can measure <clears throat> this uptake using neuroimaging um, with something called an FDG PET scan. So when we measure, uh, when we use an FDG PET scan, we call that glucose metabolism. And we, that's actually measuring the glucose coming out of your blood into primarily glial cells. But you can think of these glial cells as the support cells for neurons, sort of like mama birds. Um, and the neurons are sort of baby birds in that they actually break down the glucose into lactate and then give the lactate to neurons, which is a more readily digested form of energy. Um, so much like the mama birds partially digest, you know, worms for their babies, glial cells partially digest glucose into lactate for neurons. But neurons can actually um, take up lactate directly from the blood as well, which is shown here. Um, and that's actually a really important and understudied component of brain aging. We actually think that one reason that exercise is good for the brain is that it increases the amount of lactate that is available to go into neurons. And as you can see, um, this is the FDG PET signal, so that signal of brain glucose metabolism, glucose uptake, and it actually drops during the progression of Alzheimer's disease. So this is a PET scan, what it should look like, and then this is someone who has um, Alzheimer's disease, dementia. So the red areas are where there's a lot of glucose uptake going on, and then as you can see, that is lost um, in, as the disease progresses. So during this time, it's thought that it might be more important for other fuels like lactate or ketones to become more important and meet the brain's energy needs. And I'm going to kind of get at that um, in a moment. But just to change gears for just a second, this is sort of bringing us to exercise because exercise is a way that we know that we can actually increase blood lactate levels. So exercise has well-characterized physiological benefits. It helps with, um, you know, cardiovascular disease. It just helps with general health and mobility. But observational work has also shown that fitness has, um, fitness, which comes from exercise, has positive impacts that extend to the brain. So we've done quite a few studies now looking at this. And I'm sure many of you who have followed our programs know many of the studies that I'm going to mention. But we know that um, increasing whole body fitness is associated with higher levels of hippocampal volume, and that's that um, main brain region that's really important for memory in people with Alzheimer's disease. We've shown that risk factors um, for Alzheimer's disease, such as increasing age, female sex, um, and then APOE4 genotype, all are um, associated with lower cardiorespiratory fitness. And then we know that fitness is also associated with brain volume and then longitudinal changes in brain volume. So we're very interested in, in mechanisms and how this occurred. So um, just really briefly, several years ago during my postdoc fellowship, an exercise trial led by Jeff Burns called TEAM really demonstrated this relationship between fitness and cognitive function. So our group basically just demonstrated that increasing doses of exercise, as you can see um, in the red bars, as you go from no change in physical activity to increasing amounts of exercise per week actually improves specific aspects of thinking and that any dose of exercise was actually improved, um, enough to improve tests of attention. That's shown in the green bars. So we saw really good target engagement over six months. Um, cognitively healthy older adults really improved their fitness significantly. Um, they ranged from an improvement of 6% to 12% based on how much exercise they were doing. And <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, cognitive improvements were mediated by that improvement in fitness. We did something similar in a sister study. Um, the team study took place in older adults, but this study at depth um, took place in individuals with Alzheimer's disease. So here we found that just being in the aerobic exercise group improved the functional ability of individuals with Alzheimer's disease. And this is really how well they were able to perform activities of daily living. Um, such as, you know, getting around the house, being able to care for themselves. But there was no group difference in memory performance. So if you look over here, um, these people were basically able to maintain their um, activities of daily living. Where, and the red is where we would have expected them to be after six months. So they would be declining. The um, control group actually did decline over that amount of time. Um, but secondary analyses revealed that people who improved their fitness, which is this blue line, 
um, did improve their memory the most, suggesting again that something about this cardiorespiratory fitness change was really important to memory function. And we also saw something similar when we looked at hippocampal volume, which is again, that part of the brain that's really key to memory. So really stemming from these two studies um, that implicated increased fitness was associated with improved brain outcomes, we became interested in the mechanisms um, of what was related to fitness improvement and what is driving benefit. We really wanted to figure out how to better intervene in our studies, and we think that acute changes in blood lactate during exercise, as well as some other components, may be key to brain benefits with exercise. So I get a lot of questions about lactate and if that's related to lactose. So I just wanted to put this slide in here to clarify that because it can be really confusing. So lactate, we know, um, increases acutely with exercise and it's not related to milk. It's actually produced during the breakdown of blood sugar. And it's very essential for cellular processes, including uh, regenerating some coenzymes that are needed for glycolysis or metabolism to continue. Um, and you might have heard of like lactase and lactose, and those are um, types of sugars present in milk, but they're not really what I'm referring to here. So um, in addition, many of you have probably heard of lactic acid, and that is often blamed for that burning or soreness that you get following intense exercise. But in reality, lactic acid, we know now, doesn't really exist physiologically in the body. Lactate itself is actually a weak base, and those burning effects are really due to the generation of hydrogen ions during the breakdown of ATP and glycolysis. All that to say is that lactate can actually act as a buffer to help with this. Um, lactate is an important signaling hormone. It's been linked to inducing uh, BDNF expression, which is, uh, I'll talk about it a little later, it's sort of like a brain vitamin, as well as modulation of blood flow to your brain. So if you think back to those fuel pipes that I mentioned earlier, earlier. <clears throat> of course, it can also be used as a fuel. And lactate can spare glucose and allow it to be used in other pathways, like regeneration of glutathione, which is used to um, help deal with oxidative stress and free radicals that can also cause damage in the brain. So during exercise, we know that the um, brain actually switches is to a net uptake of lactate because there's a lot of it in the periphery and it can actually more readily use lactate than glucose. Nearly all lactate that's taken up to the brain is oxidized and used to make energy. So um, <clears throat> we know that lactate increases with exercise and we know that more strenuous exercise is associated with greater increases in lactate. We recently finished some biomarker characterization on a study called Dynamic um, that many of you might have been familiar with or, or maybe even participated in. Um, but that was looking at acute exercise and brain blood flow. So as we expected, we saw substantial increases in lactate after about 20 minutes of moderate intensity exercise, and they were sustained for about an hour post-exercise. So you can see here, you get a really big boost and it's high after exercise and then kind of goes back down as your cells take it up and clear it. But what's really interesting is that lactate is known to cross the blood-brain barrier and induce the production of EDNF. And that is that brain vitamin that I talked about earlier. It's um, a, it's a, a, not a hormone, I'm sorry. It's a molecule that is known to facilitate growth and survival of your brain cells. So um, this is just a little bit more data from that study of acute exercise showing that this study was done in um, cognitively healthy older adults. The mean age was about 72. And in this study, individuals exercised, they had a five minute warm up, 15 minutes of moderate intensity exercise. And then we took a couple, um, a, a couple blood draws after that. And you can see that the production, or not the production, the release of BDNF continues to increase after exercise is over. So you know that the increase in lactate kind of went up and came back down, but the release of BDNF continued to increase after exercise was over and we just didn't take any more blood draws after that. So we're not really sure how long this would continue to go up. So that is interesting. You know, lactate goes up and comes back down. BDNF keeps going up. Why is that? Well, we know that lactate actually increases BDNF production, but not actually storage. So what, what's happening is that your, um, your body is basically releasing stored BDNF. And um, BDNF is known to be uh, stored in platelets in your blood. And so what's happening is that this is showing, uh, this PF4 AUC is actually looking at activation of platelets 
um, basically as people exercise, their platelet activation is going up and the, the platelets are actually spewing out BDNF that they have stored inside of them. So sheer stress can actually cause this to happen. And that's probably going to be due to increased um, blood flow during exercise. So the increased blood flow is really causing the activation of platelets and the release of BDNF, which is all really, really good. So this sort of brings me to another study that we're doing right now. And this study is still enrolling, but it's almost done. Um, it's called aerobic and it stands for acute exercise response on brain imaging and cognition. So some people benefit a lot from exercise trials and others benefit less. And we think that this difference is due in part to their um, differences in physiological responses to each single bout of acute exercise. So every time you exercise, this happens, you know, your, bl your blood flow increases, your lactate goes up, your BDNF increases, but the amount that all of this occurs might be different between individuals due to different factors, maybe exercise intensity or just factors unique to that individual that we're trying to understand more readily. Um, we, we don't fully understand how brain glucose metabolism changes with exercise and if this differs between people who are cognitively healthy and people who are struggling with memory and thinking. But better understanding of this is really going to help us understand more how to intervene, whether we need to prescribe different exercise intensities or modalities or different to different groups of people, for instance. So in this study, essentially, um, we do some screening. There's four visits. One of them is an exercise test. We do that to make sure that the person's safe to exercise and we know how much to how much exercise to prescribe to them. And then there's two counterbalanced identical visits, one with exercise and one that's completely at rest. And these are identical except for that part, the actual exercise. And then there, then the there's an MRI scan at the end. So essentially we're looking at brain glucose metabolism as our primary outcome. And then we're looking at change in lactate and BDNF, those molecules that I was just talking about before. So this is showing our setup here. We have, um, this is the PET scanner where we me measure brain glucose metabolism and we have people exercise right there in the same room with the PET scanner. Um, so the crux of this study, again, comes from those comparisons of the brain PET scans and the resting versus the exercise state. And then we randomize participants into either a moderate or higher intensity exercise, and um, we, we basically compare those scans. We also compare cognitive for performance. We have a little iPad that has some, some essentially brain exercises on it, so we can compare that between the exercise and resting conditions. So yeah, we have like moderate or a little higher intensity exercise. And for this study, we need our last eight participants. We are so close to finishing and I'm so excited to be done and be able to analyze the data. Um, so right now we're really in need of individuals with a history of current memory or thinking problems. We've had our cognitively healthy group fully enrolled already. Um, we especially need females, although males are still welcome. But um, so if you know of anybody who might be a good candidate for aerobic, please pass that along to, uh, pass this information along to them and we can get them additional information if, if they're interested. So we have another study that I wanted to mention as well, and that is called LEAN. Um, LEAN stands for Lactate for Energetics and Neurocognition. It's not my best acronym, but it describes the study pretty well. Um, so if you are, in, if you're not up to an, for an exercise study, but you're still interested in metabolism and these relationships, this could be this study for you. Um, our question is, can we get the effects of exercise without the exercise? You know, is it, is it lactate or is it something else? Because we know that exercise does a lot of different things. So we're really looking um, at also whether people with and without energy problems actually use energy differently. So can lactate be taken up as readily in both groups of people? And is it metabolized the same way? So um, but for this study, we are prioritizing individuals who've completed the aerobic study. Um, but we are um, eventually going to be open to anyone who meets our inclusion criteria. Basically, we're just looking for cognitively healthy older adults and individuals with memory and thinking problems. So both with and without memory problems. There is one in-person study visit and a telephone visit as well. And you can kind of see the setup here because it is an infusion. The infusion lasts for about two hours. Um, but there's also a DEXA scan prior to that. So we can measure body composition, um, bone mineral density, muscle, and, um, and uh, lean mass and fat mass and things like that. 
I believe we can actually um, provide these provide that information back to our participants as well. We're doing blood and breath measures as well in this just to, to determine the lactate turnover outcomes. So there is a mask that you'll have to wear um, at four different times for just a few minutes just to measure. We can actually measure um, what you're breathing in and what you're expiring out. And again, this is meant to mimic the effects of exercise without the exercise. Not necessarily to think that, you know, one infusion is going to cure someone of their memory problems, but to really understand, again, the dynamics of what's happening in, at the cellular level and if this is something that we need to continue pursuing. We are hoping to enroll this study in May um, of 2023, so just a couple months, maybe April if we get things going. Um, we're just waiting on a few extra things to go through regarding some paperwork, but we are all good to go pretty much for that study. And then there's one other study I just want to uh, mention as well. What if you can't exercise? I also get that. Um, we're also looking at some uh, the effects of heat therapy. And the reason is that chaperone proteins are, um, they're something that actually also respond to stress and they're really involved in proteostasis and that protein folding that I mentioned earlier. And increasing core body temperature can have many of the same effects as exercise. It, it increases blood flow. And I mentioned blood flow increases is really important. We've seen in a pilot study that um, I'll present data for later, probably in another weekly webinar when we're closer to enrolling this study that has shown beautiful um, effects on blood pressure control. So we can see um, a lot of benefits to some of the vascular outcomes that we're looking at. And we're hoping that we will be able to see changes in blood sugar as well, because um, these mechanisms are also related to glucose metabolism and control. So that study is going to be coming in fall 2023. So that's pretty much all I have for today. Um, in summary, energy metabolism is critically important to the brain. We think that it plays an early role in the development of Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. We're really interested in understanding the etiology or the cause of these diseases but we also want to know how to better intervene and slow the diseases. So we're working on gaining a better understanding of some of these mechanisms by which our lifestyle interventions work. And when we understand mechanisms, we can actually get a little bit better understanding of how to actually design drug trials and things like that as well. So um, I had some thank yous to make. Um, we have an amazing recruitment division that's helped with these studies. Our research volunteers are really the superheroes, the people that take the time to do this. I could have the best idea and not be able to test it without our volunteers. They are just, and they're like the most altruistic, wonderful people. I also have a really amazing laboratory. I wanna thank um, Casey, Paul, Zach, Chelsea, Annika, and Riley. They are really amazing. And I have just a lot of collaborators to thank as well. So, and also um, really, really wonderful and giving um, philanthropists, especially I wanna shout out Peg McGuallan who's been really wonderful as well in the NIH. So, but that'll take any questions. Thank you so much for your attention. I, I keep looking over to the side because that's where my little picture of everyone's face is. So um, I guess I can switch it to Kelly and check the chat for some questions. Sure, yeah, uh, Dr. Morris, there's a question about the hippocampus and whether you can recover what is lost in the hippocampus through ongoing exercise. That's a great question. So um, there has been a little bit of study about this. So Kirk Erickson about maybe 10 years ago published the first study that showed that an exercise intervention actually could positively affect hippocampal volume. Um, we would tend to think of it more in terms of a slowing of decline in Alzheimer's disease, but the hippocampus is one of only a handful of brain regions that can actually regenerate. So it is possible. Um, it's something that we're definitely looking into. Okay. And uh, then we have a question about how to check about enrolling in the lean study. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I clicked back a couple of slides, I think, um, to enroll in the lean study. So yes, uh, you can actually call the recruitment number. I don't have that right now, but you can basically call the main Alzheimer's uh, disease center line and you can just ask for, tell them that you're interested in the lean study and they will get you to the right people. Thank you, uh, Tina. If you, those of you who can see the chat, the number is uh, in the chat function, uh, 913-588-0555 and press one 
and that'll get you to the right place. And we may even feature the lean study in one of our upcoming My Alliance issues. So we'll have some details about that. Uh, and then there's a third question, Dr. Morris, about um, glucose and the, how the brain reacts to it. Yes, I love this question. This is such a good question. So in general, um, when you look at an FDG PET scan, more glucose metabolism is better. It's it's definitely uh, pretty well established. However, in response to exercise, the, our hypothesis is that acutely less is going to actually be better because we think that what's happening with exercise is that your increase increases in blood lactate are going into the brain and they're decreasing the reliance of your brain on glucose. So we think that the lactate is actually, in, it's actually meeting your brain's energy needs and in sparing that glucose. So we might see a drop acutely, but long longitudinally, we think that this is going to cause some changes in some of the transporter expressions at the blood brain barrier and things that will actually lead to increased resting FDG PET. So generally it, at rest, an increase in your, your FDG PET signal, your brain glucose metabolism, brain glucose metabolism is good, but in really acutely after exercise, it might drop for a minute, but I would, I would hypothesize that even though it might drop after one acute bout of exercise, if you were in an exercise trial and you did an FDG PET scan at the beginning and the very end, you'd probably see an increase at rest. Hope that made sense. Great question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any studies coming to Olathe? Um, that is a good question. So most of our studies happen at the med center because we do need people to actually be at the, you know, the PET scanner and we need to be able to have our nursing staff on, on board to do the infusions and things. We might have some studies that do travel, but that would be, I would, I would just encourage you to reach out to the recruitment division and just ask if there are any studies in your area specifically if, if travel is a problem. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Morris. We're right at 231. So perfect, perfect timing. Thank you everyone for your participation and your excellent questions. And I know I think I can speak for everyone when I say I'm just fascinated that my brain is just 1 50th of my whole body, but does, you know, 10 times more work. That's just, it's amazing. Um, I know, it's so I crazy. Just, yeah, that's amazing. And, and that you have so much knowledge about that, Dr. Morris. Thank you on behalf of all of us. Um, we appreciate that. Um, well, uh, next week, our topic is going to be uh, therapeutic diets in Alzheimer's disease. I know food is a popular topic around here, and we'll look forward to hearing from Jessica Keller um, about what that looks like. That is one of the studies, one of the many studies we're doing at the ADRC. Um, so you'll get information uh, in your next My Alliance newsletter, which will be out on Monday. Uh, and then remember, we have our Hawaii movie premiere on Thursday, the 30th. So your next Thursday is going to be the best day of the week. I'm just going to call it right now. It's going to be full of all kinds of great stuff. And uh, I see that my colleague, Tina Lewandowski, is raising her hand. So Tina, what's up? Yeah, I just wanted to say I checked with the recruitment team and com our comment study is available at the Olathe Family YMCA gym. So if anyone is interested in that comment study, they can call the, that number 913-588-0555 and then research is option one. And I also in the chat put the lean interest form if you don't want to call and you just want to fill out that form, um, that will come to us and we will call you. So just wanted to share those things. Perfect. Great. Well, I'll leave the uh, we'll leave the chat and everything available for a few minutes so you all have time to get that link and that phone number if you like. Um, and thank you again, Dr. Morris. Thank uh, you guys for your attention. I really appreciate you coming to my my talk. Have a wonderful afternoon. Everybody take care. Oh, one last question. Maybe I, uh, if you have time, Dr. Morris, does taking vitamin B9 have any effect on glucose transmission? That is a good question. I do not know. That is that is a good question um, to ask. So I I can't answer that. Not that I know of. I will take a note of it, and yes. maybe someone else around the. Maybe if you want to send there. your contact information, I can look. Yeah. I can look into it a little bit. Right. Yeah. Can you tell us more information you mentioned about a movie premiere? Is that something we can watch online? Is it Oh, free? sure. Um, it is not yet available online. We're really um, sticking to having it be in movie theaters for now. Um, so next Thursday, the 30th, will be the premiere of a movie that the ADRC put together called Why? 
and it's a look at early uh, stage dementia, early stage Alzheimer's disease. And you hear from uh, people with a diagnosis with their caregivers from Dr. Jeff Burns um, here at our ADRC, from Michelle Needens, and lots of other folks about what that experience has been like. Um, the screening next Thursday and all the screenings so far that we're planning is free. Um, next Thursday, it's at the Glenwood Arts Theater on 95th Street and Mission Road in Leewood. Uh, and we're working on several other screenings around Kansas City and around the state of Kansas coming up um, this spring and summer. And we will announce those through My Alliance and on our social media pages. So stay tuned. If you get My Alliance, you will know, you'll be the first to know uh, where the screenings are. And we'll be happy to have you. And someone asked earlier what the runtime of the movie is. And it's about 38 minutes. Um, and then we will have, after the screening, an opportunity for questions and comments and interaction from the audience. Uh, so uh, we'd love to see you all there. We'd love to have a full house uh, next Thursday and at every event thereafter. If anybody is in or near Hanover, Kansas, that's the next showing on Friday, March 31st at the Kloppenberg Senior Center uh, in Hanover, Kansas. And then the next local showing is uh, local ish showing is in Leavenworth at the First United Methodist Church in Leavenworth, Kansas, on April twentieth. Um, so stay tuned. My Alliance will be a good way for you to find out when and where you can see why. And that's uh, again, what, it's what time next Thursday? Sure. Um, it, we're starting at six thirty. There is no trailer, so if you're one of those people that says, "Oh, I'll go," and they'll be showing all those commercials, nope. We are going to start right at six thirty. Um, and it's like I said, it runs about 38 minutes, um, and then we'll have time for questions after. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for all your great questions. And um, I hope everybody's got the information that they need from the chat. Um, if not, this will be on, on our YouTube channel within 24 hours or so, so you can go back and watch again and and uh, see all the great information. And then in the meantime, we will be back with you next Thursday. Everybody have a great week. Take care.